A blessed morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Especially that uh, another month is about to end in this new year. We hope that God is keeping you safe and He is nurturing you as we all remain steadfast in Him. As we begin, allow me to lead you to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, where it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Brethren, let us prepare our hearts and minds this morning as we proclaim the great love of our Lord God for us through His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and His continuing work in us through the Holy Spirit. Please bow down your heads with me as we pray. Our most loving and gracious Father, Lord, we praise You and magnify You for who You are in our lives. We exalt You and bless Your holy name. You alone are worthy of all our praises and honor. And this morning, we just lift you up. We just lift the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, we just thank you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's acknowledge our living God. Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of all majesty, risen King, Lamb of God, holy and righteous, blessed redeemer. 
sing Is it any wonder we sing Is it any wonder God's gracious blessings of inspiration and wisdom through Christ by the workings of the Holy Spirit be unto all of you today. I trust that you are all set with eager hearts and mind to study and meditate on God's Word. Let us come with humble hearts before the Lord. Please bow down with me for prayers. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we acknowledge your holiness with reverence and godly fear. We submit ourselves to the workings of your grace to fill our souls with the richness of your truth and cause us to see you and your wonderful plan and design for each of us whom you have called into Christ Jesus. Let these help us to be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I went through the continuing story of Elijah and God's discipline of Israel here in 1 Kings chapter 17, now in verse 18 and 24, I was reminded of an incident that took place many years ago when my wife and I were on our way home to Cagayan de Oro City from a few days of ministry in one of our outreach work in Valencia City, Bukidnon. It was some 130 kilometers of a mixture of mountain and flatland roads from Cagayan. We encountered engine trouble with our 1960 Volkswagen Combi fitted with a diesel engine, but we managed to reach our destination in time for my functions. Things went very well by the grace of God as I preached and taught during those few days. On our way home, around late afternoon, my wife and I were in good spirits and thankful to the Lord that all went well not only in ministry, but also for the car until we came to a steep downhill gravel road under repair. The bolts on the rear wheel on the driver's side came loose and the entire wheel flew up to somewhere I was not able to observe. Thank God there was still some pressure on the brake and I managed to put the vehicle to a dead stop on a lonely part of the road. No soul in sight to call for help. Our joyful spirits and outlook were suddenly replaced by anxiety. I can imagine a much greater feeling and thoughts to the two main characters in our story, in our passage, Elijah and the widow of Sarifat, when the boy dies unexpectedly. What saved the day was God's graciousness to respond to prayer and brought about a wonder never before 
accounted in biblical records till 1st Kings chapter 17 verses 17 to 24 let's read our passage now it came about after these things that the son of the woman the mistress of the house became sick and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. He said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. We continue in our Part 3 of our study and meditation, we titled, Be Steadfast, God is in Control. Now, before I continue, if you had just joined us now, you might want to go through the recordings and accompanying sermon handouts of Part 1 and Part 2 of this series in our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Now, let's continue. If you may recall, in the first two messages on 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 to 7 and 8 to 16, things were going amazingly well. In accordance with God's plan, we saw God's miraculous protection and provision to his faithful servant Elijah and to this widow willing to follow God's word. Suddenly in verse 17, which opens the third scene, the widow's son falls ill and dies. The boy who was saved from starvation was not spared of severe illness and untimely death. There was no warning from the Lord to his servant Elijah, no explanation for the boy's illness and death, nor is there any authoritative word on how this incident fits into God's plan. This leaves both the widow and Elijah himself searching for answers to the question we all ask when confronted with similar experiences. And what is that question? Why, Lord? This story reminds us that life can just move along and then suddenly tragedy strikes. Whether a natural calamity, a sudden unforeseen event, an alarming medical finding, a very disheartening news, or things similar, life can quickly take a wrong turn. As we meditate and study our passage, I pray that we would appreciate our advantage over our two main characters, simply because we today can step back and reflect 
to gain a bigger and more accurate picture of who our Lord is and what He is doing to work out His purposes in us. Our outlook would be so different if we were the ones caught up in the emotional confusion of our own tragic situation or our own experiences of heartbreaks. So, brethren, through this vantage point, let us look at the vital truths that would develop in us godly perspectives, confidence, and divine wisdom as we go through the trials and the perplexities of life. Let us learn vital lessons from this scene in our passage today so we can be steadfast as God is always in control. First of these lessons is no incidents are accidents among the chosen of God. And we find this in verse 17. Let me read for you. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. We find here in verse 17 the account of the sudden sickness and death of the widow's son. And it seemed like an accident. The Oxford Dictionary defines accident as an event that happens by chance or that is without apparent or deliberate cause. While it's true we have the unforeseen and the unexpected happen to us, but from God's perspective, there are no accidents, particularly in the life of someone whom God has chosen. Now, uh, that sounds nice, Pastor Bobby, but the fact of the matter is the child got severely ill and died. Like the widow, we also find the tragic incident hard to believe. It doesn't seem fair and it does not make sense that God, after miraculous supply of food to sustain them, suddenly allows this tragedy to happen without warning. But the obvious reasons can be drawn from our passage itself. And we see this, the first reason, it is to increase the widow's confidence and faith in God. And this incident, as we look at data in our passage, we can see that God allowed this for a purpose, and that is to increase the widow's confidence and faith in God. Now, I say this because Elijah, while living with the widow and her son, likely was teaching her about Yahweh. She, like most of us today, may have been more focused in the blessings for daily sustenance rather than getting to know more the Lord, the blesser. Listen to her words in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Now, this implies that she had just come further in deeper realization of who God truly is because of this tragic incident. For the chosen of God in Christ, troubles and trials in this life are allowed by God not to destroy us, but to develop our faith and confidence in Him. As someone has said, sometimes you feel like you are being buried when in truth you are really being planted. God is using the situation to grow you. Brethren, there is a difference between 
knowing the miracle of God and knowing the God of miracles. When we truly know the God of miracles, we will have the faith and the confidence to serve Him, to be secured and satisfied in Him, and to share Him boldly with others. The second obvious reason for the tragic incident that can be inferred from our passage is to intensify Elijah's credibility and his faith in God. In our passage, we see that the second reason that God allowed this tragic incident is to intensify Elijah's credibility and his faith in God. Notice that he is unable to provide an immediate word of assurance to the widow's hostile reaction that the tragic incident is all part of God's plan. Elijah had no quick words to defend the character of God from the widow's negative presumptions. In verse 19, Elijah simply says, Give me your son. Perhaps he himself struggled to imagine that God would allow such painful incident at that time. So Elijah takes the boy from the widow's embrace to somehow remove from her the very point of her inconsolable grief. He takes the dead boy to the upper room to bring the matter before God. In verse 20, it tells us, In privacy, Elijah lifts up his faith as he called to the Lord. And to paraphrase Elijah's prayer, he was saying, What are you doing, Lord? Did you bring me to this widow and commit me to her hospitality? Then you allow this tragedy to happen. Notice here that Elijah, in contrast with previous prayers, is not in a posture of waiting on God's timing and God's word on the matter at hand. Instead, the first part of verse 21 tells us, Then he stretched himself upon the child three times. Perhaps in desperation, he tried to somehow transfer a portion of his own life to the dead child. Note, Elijah, rather than waiting and listening for God's response, asserts himself and makes a bold petition to God in the second half of verse 21, saying, and let me read for you, O oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord God granted Elijah's petition and revived the child. Elijah brought the child down to his mother and in an almost bragging fashion said to her in verse 23, See, your son is alive. The widow, seeing her son revive in Elijah's arms, proclaims in the succeeding verse. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. In other words, she is expressing her full trust in the credibility of God and God's servant. Brethren, in application, there will be times when the turn of our circumstances does not make sense or it is not consistent with who God is. A similar incident is when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, we, from verses 1 to 19. 
Abraham did not hesitate and wondered about God's seemingly unreasonable demand. Abraham had great faith through his personal knowledge of God, so he took the initiative and did his part, and eventually, he confirmed what he knew all along, that God is reasonable, reliable, and righteous always. Elijah, in our passage, took the initiative before God and was greatly rewarded. Let me add that there are situations that call for our resourcefulness, creativity, and courage. If we want to see the miracles of God, we cannot continue to be passive in certain situations. And we cannot continue to be afraid of making mistakes while trying to be useful for God. Did you hear that? I believe there is a certain amount of application to us of God's word in Isaiah 41 verses 9 to 10, which says, and let me read for you. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It is comforting to realize that with the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God, there is no incidents that are accidents among God's chosen in Christ. The second lesson we can learn from our passage today, so we can be steadfast because God is always in control, is no spiritual gain without suffering pain happens among the chosen of God. And we come now to verse 18. Verse 18 gives us a vivid picture of the extreme suffering and pain the widow had to go through. It is difficult to imagine as a parent myself to see my only child fall seriously ill and watch helplessly as he dies in my arm. That is truly unimaginable to bear. Suffering and pain has a way of deforming our view of God, particularly in our view of life in general. In her grief, the widow suspects and blames Elijah, saying in verse 18, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. She called Elijah man of God, not out of respect, but with sarcasm, implying that Elijah's God, though powerful, is also a cruel God. Her heart was wrong because her expectations of God were wrong. It is likely she thought that with the prophet of God in her home, she would be immune to major problems. Many in the world has this superstitious belief about God and maintains a picture, a statue, some special object for protection, and good luck thinking it would shield them from suffering and pain and make life flow along smoothly. But such view is opposite the mind of God in scriptures. God is not committed to just giving us comfortable lives. God is committed to transforming our lives into the likeness of His Son. And we see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. 
he often uses suffering and pain in doing so. Regarding this, I am reminded of C.S. Lewis' famous statement, which says, and let me read for you as I quote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Jesus points this out in the picture of the vine dresser in John chapter 15, verse 2, the second part of verse 2, which says, and let me read, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. In Jesus' analogy, pruning implies hurt and pain. It is the very evidence of God's love and faithful care showing He is at work preparing us for usefulness and greater blessings. Pain, let me point out, is never wrong. It is only natural and God expects and allows us to feel pain. We complicate our problems when we allow pain to tempt us to react adversely rather than respond to what God is doing in us. Let me close this second point with a fitting illustration. The ancient Roman method of threshing grain pictures one man always turning over sheaves with a rake while another man rides over them in a cart fitted with rollers instead of wheels. Sharp stones and rough bits of iron were attached to these cylinders to help separate the husk from the grain. This cart was called a tribulum, from which we get our word tribulation in God's method of transforming us to Christ-likeness, we are often tempted to think we are being shred to pieces under the cruel pressures of difficult circumstances. Yet no treasure ever used this tribulum for the purpose of destroying his sheaves, but to bring forth the precious grain. In the same way, God our Father has ruled that there is no spiritual gain without suffering and pain taking place among the chosen of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 7 is very relevant. Let me read. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The third and final lesson we can glean from our passage today so we can be steadfast because God is always in control. Yes, there is no rejection to humble supplications among the chosen of God. And this brings us to verses 19 to 24. I would not read the passage. It is in your handout. And you may follow with me there. But let me say, when the widow lashed out at Elijah, he understood the depth of her grief and did not retaliate. Rather, in verse 19, he takes the boy from the mother and carries him up to his room to pray with boldness. Elijah's boldness in prayer is rooted in faith and recognition of who God is. 
His boldness drove him to pray persistently, believing by faith in God for the impossible. It is important to highlight the content of Elijah's prayer. In verse 21, the first part, Elijah addressed God as, O Lord, my God. And let me point out, Lord is Yahweh, signifying that he was sincerely reaching directly to the sovereign covenant-keeping God of Israel. This title reflects Elijah's deep knowledge of God. The term, my God, is Elohai, implying that Elijah pleaded a according to his personal relationship with the sovereign, almighty, and covenant faithful God. Note his question in the second half of verse 20. Have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Now, this question expresses his knowledge of God's control over all that happens in life. Take note of that, brethren. But the fact that Elijah connected this death of the boy with his staying with the widow suggests Elijah has realizations of some special purpose of God for him in this tragedy. Tragic death is a normal occurrence in this fallen world. But Elijah was focusing on the Lord in terms of God's earlier revelation that guided him a long way to this widow's home. In verse 21, Elijah pleads boldly, O Lord, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord granted Elijah's petition and revived the child. This was the first miracle of its kind to be recorded in Scripture. There was never a miracle of anyone being raised from the dead prior to this account. This miracle was not only amazing in its uniqueness and precedence, but it distinguished Yahweh from all other claimants of deity. So also with us who are in Christ, we have the Lord's invitation and command to cast all our cares on Him, for He cares for us. Let us have confidence that there is no rejection to humble supplication among the chosen of God in Christ Jesus. Brethren, pray without doubting God will answer. His reply may be a yes, it could be a no, or not yet, but He will surely answer. Let us believe the Lord's faithfulness that He will answer in the best way. Let me end with the closing of the story I opened this message with. As I got out of the vehicle to look for the wheel that flew off, it began to drizzle with the sky threatening with rain. I was upset and protested in prayer. And I said, Lord, it is bad enough that we lost the wheel it will even be more difficult to find it because of the rain. And we are close to nightfall. As I grumbled in my heart and looking around, I saw a strange white smoke rise above the tall grass on the far left across the road. I rushed to investigate, and lo and behold, it was the missing wheel. The white smoke was the rainwater evaporating from the overheated wheel drum. I realized, I suddenly realized what the drizzle was for. 
I was able to attach the wheel back by borrowing bolt nuts from the other three wheels. And we were back on our way at low speed, stopping to check the damaged wheel every few kilometers. I had a lot of time recounting with Carmen my embarrassing reactions of complaints and apprehensions before God over my less fatal circumstances. I realized that my troubles were not even close to the widow's ordeal, but my reactions were far worse than hers. She complained and lashed out only at Elijah. My grumbling was directly to God. Worse, I was a teacher of the word. She was very new in the faith. I repented of these wrongful feelings and thoughts through the rest of the way back home. In closing, that incident sealed a lesson in me that episodes to doubt and grumble against God regarding our circumstances will always return to tempt us. So when the Lord allows times of troubles and trials, times that remind us of our sins, times that may cast doubt in our following Jesus, in such times, let me encourage you to cling to God and to His eternal truth. Hold on to His faithful promise even though our emotions and our thoughts seem contrary. Let us trust Him and His character even more. Let us be reminded always of God's promise in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, that says, I will never desert you. I will never, ever forsake you. God in Christ is always in control. Now, before we close in prayer, let me turn to those of you who are not sure you are in Christ. Like the oil and flour that cannot be exhausted to produce bread. Jesus Christ today is the bread of life. He's God's provision for the spiritual hunger of those who are being touched by God to recognize Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. If you are someone who has not yet at any time surrendered your life to Christ to acknowledge His finished work on the cross and His resurrection so that He can be Lord of your life, I invite you to acknowledge that you and I are all sinners by virtue of the inherited sin from Adam and Eve. If you accept that truth, will you submit to Christ and surrender to Him as your Lord, relying on His grace to change you into His likeness as you follow Him and His Word? If you are someone who has not yet at any time surrendered your life to Christ, to acknowledge His finished work on the cross and His resurrection so that He could be your Lord, the Lord of your life. I invite you now to acknowledge that you and I and all of us are all sinners by virtue of the inherited sin from Adam and Eve. If you accept that truth, will you submit to Christ and surrender to Him as your Lord and Savior, relying on His grace to change you into His likeness as you follow Him and His Word. And if you had come to faith through all of those truths I have just laid down before you, I request you, to let us know by writing on the comment section of the Facebook page 
or the YouTube channel. We would love to hear from you and assist you in your spiritual growth in Christ. For all of us, let us close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your grace that helped us to learn and be refreshed regarding you and your wonderful ways for us, whom you have chosen in Christ. Thank you for the inspiration and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. May we be steadfast, firm, and confident in Christ amid the challenges we face day by day. We ask for your protection and provision for this new week you have given us, so we may be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now for the benediction. May the strength of God sustain you. May the power of God preserve you. And may the hands of God protect you. May the wisdom of God direct you. And may the love of God go with you always till He returns so we could be with Him forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and may the blessings of the Lord be mighty upon you this week. We shall see each other again. Great are you, Lord. Is it any wonder? Great are you, Lord. Is it any wonder? Great are you, Lord. We sing, great are you. Great are you, Lord. Is it any wonder? Great are you, Lord. Is it any wonder? Blessed be your name, O God. Blessed be your name, O God.